theyeshiva.net. Okay, today's class is dedicated by a dear friend, Peter Brown. And thank you very, very much for your friendship and love and generosity and partnership. And a lot of hatzlocha and success and blessing and everything for you and your loved ones. We have a nice wind today. Just to add a little gusto is the word. So, Parshas Tazriya has a haftira that is rarely read because it's the haftira you need Tazriya to be self-contained and you need Shabbos Tazriya not to coincide with Parshas HaChodesh and Rosh Chodesh as it is this year. But nonetheless, this is the haftira of Parshas Tazriya and it tells a fascinating story that deals with the theme of the Parsha, which is, of course, leprosy, tsaras. It tells a story about a great military warrior who was a Metzairah, who was a leper, and who was seeking to heal himself from this terrible calamity, this terrible uh, disease or illness. And it's in Melachim Bey's Perik Hay. It's in the second book of Kings, the fifth chapter, and it's part of the Haftarah, of Parshas Tazriya. I want to learn this story with you today. It's a uh, story like every story in Tanakh. It's a very loaded story. Every Pasuk has many layers and dimensions of interpretation and commentary. But at least we can touch upon some of the major themes of the story on different levels and also their application to life today. So the background of the story is, takes us to the country known as Aram. Aram, the capital of Aram was Damascus, Damascus. That's the area of Syria today. Basically, the north east of Eretz Yisrael, of the land of Israel. And the military warrior of Aram, one of the great military commanders of the kingdom of Aram was a man named Naaman. That's on the Aram side. On the Jewish side, the main personality of the story is a well-known figure in Tanakh known as Elisha, who was, of course, the disciple of Eliyahu, Eliyahu Anavi, Elijah. In English, they call him Elisha. That's the background of the story. And this is how the Tanakh begins the story, which is, I said, part of the Aftarah of Tazriya. And let's see inside, you have it in the source sheets. Venamon, Sartsva Melech Aram Hoya Ish Godel Lifnei Avdoinov. Naaman, who is the military commander of the king of Aram. Aram was a very powerful empire that existed during the Syrian Empire, that existed during the time of the first Beis Amikdash, until the Assyrian Empire defeated the empire of Aram. So during this time of Elisha, which was of course during the time of the first Beis Amikdash, Aram was a very powerful kingdom and empire. And Naaman was the military commander of Aram. He was a great man. He was very prominent before his master. In the Suponim, he was of great renown. He was um, extremely pleasing for him. Kiboy Nasan Hashem Chual Aram. Because he was the figure through which Hashem salvaged Aram. In its wars against its enemies, Naaman was the military genius, the commander who arranged for a victory for Aram. This man was mighty. He was a great warrior. He was a person of great renown and valor. He was a real, very, Gibber Chayil is a powerful, courageous person. Mitzayra, however, it came with something else. He was a Mitzayra. Now, Mitzayra is usually translated as a leper. It's not an exact translation because Mitzayra, the t- symptoms of Tsaras and Chumash, are symptoms that are similar to leprosy in the sense that it's a skin disease. But the symptoms of tsaras and chumash are somewhat different than what we call today leprosy. The common denominator is that it's a disconfiguration on the skin. So he was a Mitzayri, he had this, this leprosy. And the apostle continues, Aram had this... Uh, this method, they would send out gdudim, gdudim are troops, groups of soldiers 
groups of, of men. In one of these raids, they abducted, they kidnapped from Eretz Yisrael a young girl, a Jewish girl. And she worked for the wife, for the spouse of Naaman. Naaman was the general, he was the great commander. And it was part of his work. He authorized these types of uh, terrorist, violent raids. So now this girl is captured by Aram and she's working for his wife in their house. One day, this young Jewish girl tells her master, the wife of Naaman, if my master, Naaman, will go and plead before the Jewish Novi, in Samaria, she's a smart girl. <laughs> she may have been a Narek Tana, but she was a smart girl. It reminds you of Yosef in slavery. She says, if my master would go plead, Achali is like Vayichal Moshe, if he would go beg, plead, before the Jewish prophet who lives in Shomron, in Samaria, which is the northern part of Eretz Yisrael, which was close, very close to Syria, closer to Syria, as you know, the Golan Heights was conquered in our generation, 1967 was taken, was liberated by Israel from Syria. So if my master goes to the Navi in Shomron, he will gather him in, he will eliminate the leprosy from him. Wow. Naaman was enthralled by what this little girl said. So he goes to his own master, to the king, and he says, you know, we have this young woman from Eretz Yisrael who's in my house, and this is what she says. So the king of Aram says, Lech boy, go, come to him, go. I will send a letter, Sefer we translate as a book, but here it means a letter, a manuscript, correspondence to the king of Yisrael, to the king of the Jewish people, of Malchus Yisrael, and I will get the king to influence the prophet to do the work. He went, he always need money, so he goes and he takes 10, what you would call 10, Kikre Kesef, Kikre is a very heavy weight of, of silver, so a very nice amount, 10 of Kikre Kesef, Vesheshes Halafim Zav, we have the word Kikre in Parshas Pkude, Vesheshes Halafim Zav, and 6,000 uh, golden coins, Vesheshes Halifos Bgadim, and 10 changes of garments, so he goes really with a very impressive sum of, uh, of money and cloaks, Vayavei HaSefer El Melech Yisrael Leimer, and he brings this letter to the king of Yisrael, saying, in the letter it says, This is a quote from the letter. In the letter it says that the king of Aram wrote that when this letter comes to you, to the Jewish king, I'm sending you my servant, Naaman. He's the military general, but he works for the king, for the monarch of Aram so that you should make sure that he gets cured from his leprosy. Now you would ask a question, why is he sending him to the king and not to the prophet? Obviously, he understands that there's a hierarchy and could be the prophet works for the king and the king is ultimately the boss and there's some way how it works. He goes to the king, the king will tell the prophet what to do, the prophet will do his magic or whatever he does, he'll do his voodoo and he'll be healed. But when the king of Yisrael reads this letter, he actually tears his garments. Why? He says, Have I become a god that I can either bring death or life to people? He's sending me somebody for me to heal? Obviously, this is just a provocation. He is trying to trigger me. He wants to say that I'm guilty in not healing his military general, and now he can declare war against Eretz Yisrael. So he tears his garments because he realizes this is a tragedy in the making, a catastrophe is happening. Who, how is he supposed to heal anybody? He can't give such a command. He's not a god. And therefore, obviously, this is just a provocation. Vayihi kishmoya 
Elisha Isha Lekim Kekara Malach Yisrael is Bgadov. Elisha hears the news. Elisha, who is a man of God, hears that the king of Yisrael rented, he tore his garments. So Elisha sends a message to the king, why do you have to tear your garments? Let Naaman come to me. And he will become aware, he will become cognizant that Yesh Navi be Yisrael. There is a Navi, there is a prophet among Yisrael, among Israel, among the Jewish people. Okay? If this is the message, this is what the king gives over to Naaman, who came from Aram. Naaman comes with his horse and with his chariot. And he stands at the entrance of the home of Elisha. So this is the context now of the story. Naaman now arrives to Elisha's home. Elisha is confident that Naaman will find out that his Anavi be Yisrael. What happens? Elisha Malach Lamer. Elisha sends a messenger. Malach here means a Malach is a messenger in Hebrew. So Elisha sends a messenger saying, Go and bathe seven times in the Jordan, in the Yarden of the Jordan River, and your flesh will return to you the way it was in its pristine, healthy state, utahar, and cleanse yourself. So he wants him to do seven dips, bathe seven times, submerge himself at least seven times in the Jordan, and that's how he will be healed. Vayiktsoif Naman. Naman is furious. Vayelach, he goes away. Vayoyme, he says, Hine amarti elai, yeitse yotsoi. I thought that he will come out to me. <laughs> he'll greet me. Vayamad vikaru b'shem Hashem alikav. And he'll stand and he'll call in the name of his God. And he'll wave his hand over the space of my leprosy. And he will heal. He will eliminate the leprosy. That's what I was expecting. The prophet comes out. He greets a, a, a celebrity, a man of such renown like Naaman. He speaks to his God and he heals it. He puts his hand over it. He heals it. Talk about eloquence. In Damascus, there are two great rivers. They exist till today. They're world-renowned. Called Amona and Parpar. He says the waters of Amona and Parpar, the rivers of Damascus, are far superior than all the waters, all the rivers in Eretz Yisrael. I have bathed in them. I have cleansed myself in them. The Jordan is going to help me. He goes away in fury, in anger. If Elisha would come out to him, speak to God, have him heal the leprosy, wave his hand over it, I understand. He's sending me to go swimming. He's sending me to go bathe myself in the Jordan River. How do you compare the Jordan River to the Amona, to the Piper and Damascus, which are known to be far larger, far cleaner, far more... Uh, exquisite, beautiful water than the Jordan. So his servants, Naaman came with an entourage. His servants come over to him and they say, Avi, my father, my master, like a, a, a expression of respect. If the prophet would have told you to do something very big, very dramatic, very courageous, you would probably do it. So he told you to do something simple. If the, if the Elisha would have told you to do something very strange, very weird, something that would require a lot of effort and toil and exertion, you would probably go do it, because the prophet said. So he told you to do something simple. He told you to go bathe in the Jordan. What's there to lose? He listened to them. He descended. He descended. And he submerged. He toiled. Submerged himself in the Jordan seven times like the words of the man of God. And his flesh returns to the pristine softness and freshness and health like the flesh of a young child, a young lad, a young boy. And he is completely pure, completely cleansed. Vayoshev el isha machaneu. 
Now he comes back. He doesn't go home. He comes back to Elisha. He and his entire machana, his entire entourage. He stands before him and he says, I have now become cognizant that there is no God on the entire earth, on the entire planet earth, only be Yisrael, only among the Jewish people. Meaning the only authentic God, the only Elohim that is authentic is be Yisrael, is the God worshipped in Yisrael. So please take a bracha, as Rashi says, a gift, like uh, Yaakov said, kachna birchasi, a gift, take a blessing, a gift from your servant. He calls him your servant. Vayoymer Elisha says, Chai Hashem asher amadati By the life of God, I swear, that I will not take anything. He pleads with him. He, he begs him to take. Elisha refuses. I will not take money for this. So Naman says, Okay. If you're not taking anything, then I want to take something from you. Can you give me a gift of earth? And I wonder, earth, should be able to be the amount, the quantity of earth that would fill the load of two donkeys. In other words, as much as earth that two donkeys, a group, a pair of two donkeys can carry, that's how much earth I want from here. Why? I will never ever offer an offering. I will never bring an oil or a zevach, any sacrifice to any god. Remember, Aram was a pagan society, like most of societies at the time. They offered sacrifices to all types of pagan deities. I'm not going to do it anymore. I am only going to serve La Hashem, Hashem. And therefore, apparently, he wants to build an altar from the earth of Eretz Yisrael that he wants to take from Elisha's region. And he asks permission to build a Mizbeach because he is now going to sacrifice only to God. He doesn't want to use their pagan ashrams and monasteries and altars and temples. One thing I have to apologize for. You know, my, my, my king, my master, is going to go to Beis Rimon, that's the temple of Rimon, which was a center of idolatry. He's going to prostrate himself there to his pagan gods. And he leans on me. He leans on me. I have to help him. So as he wants to bow down in base Rimon, I'm going to bow down with him. Simply to be a support for the king, even though I don't believe in any of this anymore. I hope God will be able to forgive me. Elisha says, Leich l'shalem, go in peace. Vayelech me'itoy kivras eretz. And he accompanies him as he walks off and uh, Kivras Eretz is a certain section, a certain volume of land. He escorts him goodbye, and Naaman goes back home to Aram. That's the end of the story that's read in the Haftarah of Parshas Tazria. There's another sequel to the story in the Tanakh, and that is Elisha has a servant. You may call him a gabai, a, a secretary, an assistant, a right-hand man. His name is Gehazi. And Gehazi is very upset that Elisha didn't take money. <laughs> Naaman was such an affluent person. How can the prophet forfeit such an opportunity to take money. So Gehazi actually pursues Naaman, and he lies. He concocts a story that Elisha was just visited by two Jews who are coming to learn by him, and they're poverty-stricken, and they don't have anything, and Elisha wants to get some things from Naaman. He didn't ask for it before because the boys just came. And he swears to Naaman that he's saying the truth. He c c creates a lie. And Naaman gives him, Naaman gives him, he doesn't ask for a lot, but Naaman gives him money and he gives him bread and clothes. And Gehazi comes back. Elisha asks him where he is. Gehazi says a new lie, swears on a new lie. And as the sages say, if Gehazi would have been honest with Elisha, Elisha could have helped him, but Gehazi lied to Elisha as well. And that's when Elisha tells him that the leprosy of Naaman is now going to go over to you. And Gehazi who was in cahoots with his children, he and his children become lepers. And the next story is how four people are lepers outside of the city during a time of hunger, which becomes the Haftar of Parshas Mitzayr. On this piece of Naaman, there's a fascinating medrash. 
that contrasts four people. You know, the Chazal always study the Tanakh very, very uh, meticulously, with great precision. And whenever they noticed a variance in the way something is expressed, they understood it's not coincidental. It's deliberate. They contrast four people, four personalities. You wouldn't think there would be a contrast between them. One is Yisroi. The other one is Rachav. The third is Naman. And the fourth is Moshe. The fascinating thing is that the first three are not Jewish. And the fourth one is, is the, the first Jewish leader. Quite Jewish. Moshe. Now, Rachav, according to tradition, converts to Judaism. Yisroi, at least according to many traditions, converts to Judaism. Naaman doesn't. Naaman, the Gemara says in Gitin, in Nafanzayin, is a Ger Toshav. A Ger Toshav means somebody who accepts the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noyach. So they don't worship Avodah Zara. The Rambam says in Hilchas Malachim, in the Laws of Kings, something very fascinating that actually most Jews don't know about because for much of history it wasn't relevant. It couldn't have been relevant. The Rambam says in the Laws of Kings, that when Moshe Rabbeinu gave the Jewish people the Torah, he gave them one more commandment. In the name of Hashem. That the Jewish people should influence every person living on the earth. To observe the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noyach. Part of the responsibility of the Jewish people was, literally, to change the whole world, to change humanity. Now you understand, for most of history, Jews were busy trying... <laughs> <laughs> to live and breathe. So the last thing they needed was to go and try to convince other people how they should live. The Rambam. The Rambam in the laws of kings. Hilchus Malachim. Tziva Moshe Rabbeinu mipi ha'gvura. Moshe gave this a message from, the, from Hashem that this is the responsibility of the Jewish people. The Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noyach are the basics of civilization. The seven mitzvahs that ensure a normal world, a civil world, a world of goodness, a world of civility, a world of kindness, a world in which you can live peacefully, a compassionate world. A gay Toshav is a non-Jew, doesn't become Jewish, but lives up to the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noyach. We call them also Chassidi Um Sa'ilam, which means good people, pious people, people who live a good life. As the Rambam also says, Yeshlem Chelek Leilam Haba. They all have a portion in the world to come. Judaism was the one religion that didn't insist that there's no salvation outside of Judaism. Other religions, Christianity, there's an expression in Latin, no salvation outside of the church. If you don't accept Christianity, you know where you end up for eternity. Same is true with other great, very powerful religions. In Judaism, that was never an idea. Every person has their tafke, their purpose, and when you live up to your purpose and you fulfill it, that's, the, that's your ultimate greatness. You don't need to emulate Somebody else or something else. So Naaman was a Ger Toshav. But all three, besides Moshe, at, at least initially were not Jewish, and the Chazal contrasts them. What, what's the contrast? The contrast is the way they talk about Hashem. And I want to show you this Medrash. It's your third source. Dvarim Rabba Perig Beis, Pasuk Chavches. Medrash Rabba Parshas Veschanan, Sefer Dvarim, Chapter 2, Section 28. Rabbanon Amri, the rabbi, said, Yisroi nosan mamish b'avodas kechavon. Yisroi, despite his greatness, he conferred some substance upon idolatry. Shenemar. He tells Moshe Rabbeinu when he comes in Parshas Yisroi, Yisroi takes Tzipoyer, his daughter, and his two grandchildren, Gershom and Eliezer, and he comes to the desert to meet his son-in-law, Moshe, and he speaks to Moshe and he says those those famous words, Now I know that Hashem is greater than all the gods. Rashi famously says, obviously, Yisroi studied every single deity out there. Because how could you say God is greater than all the gods? So Chazal say, There was not a single Avodah that Yisroi didn't worship. So he could make a statement. Yisroi went to every divinity school. In every university on the planet, he was a seeker. So he could say, But look at his expression. Expression is, From all the other gods. So he calls them gods, but he says God is on top. That's Yisra. Now we go to Naaman. Naaman Naaman went up a step. Naaman submitted and he acknowledged part of the truth. Naaman tells Elisha, 
הנה נו ידעתי כי אין אלוהים בכל הארץ, כי אם בישראל. When Naaman bathes in the Jordan seven times, and he is cured, and he comes back to Elisha, what does he say? He says, now I know that there's no Hashem, there's no God, בכל הארץ, on all of earth, on all of planet earth, אין אלוהים, there's nothing else. There's no true presence, there's no true power, besides Kiyam be Yisrael, besides the God that Yisrael embraced, the monotheistic faith of the Jewish people. Rachav, Rachav goes up a notch. Rachav samasu bashamayim uba'aretz. Rachav places God as the exclusive power in heaven and earth. Shenema, this is the beginning of Sefer Yahushua, Joshua chapter 2. Remember, Yahushua sends two spies to go see what's happening in Eretz Yisrael before they go to conquer. They go into the city of Yericho, Jericho. They stay in the hotel, Motel 6 of Rachav. And Rachav speaks to them and she ultimately saves them from the king of Yericho. She has them sliding down the wall with a rope and they get away. And Rachav in return gets a promise that when they conquer Yericho, she and whoever will be in her home, she puts the red string on her home, will be saved. So Rachav tells the spies, she says, your God is the God. He's the God in heaven and in earth. Yisrael says God is greater than all the gods. Okay, he gives some substance to Avay Dezar. Naaman says there's no God like God on earth, there's nothing else. Rachav says on heaven too. Bashamayim imav alaretz mitachas. Now we come to Moshe. Moshe, Samay af b'chaloloi shal oilam. Moshe places him, very interesting expression, he places God even b'chaloloi shal oilam, even in the airspace of the world. Even in the airspace of our planet and of the entire universe, he, he places God even in the airspace. Shenemar, Moshe says in Parshas Veschana, Ki Hashem hua, the famous Pasuk, we say it in Aleinu, V'yadata hayoyim v'ashevoy salavavecha, Ki Hashem hua elikim, V'ashamayim imal, V'ala oritz mitochas einoit. He adds two words, einoit. Rachav also said, V'ashamayim imal v'ala oritz mitochas. But Moshe added two words, einoit. God is, Hashem is elikim in heaven and in earth. Einoit, there's nothing else. What's nothing else? You already said. You already said, heaven and earth, there's only one God. Afilu b'chalolo yishaloylam. Ein oid means even in the space between heaven and earth, there's a lot of space. Over there too, ein oid. That's, that Rachav didn't say. Rachav said Shemayim and Eretz. Yisroi didn't even give it Eretz. Naaman gave it Eretz, not Shemayim. Moshe gave it Shemayim and Eretz and chalolo yishaloylam. Now this is a fascinating contrast, but it shows you how the Chazal learned Tanakh. They saw that four people throughout the Tanakh talk about God's oneness, Hashem's oneness, Achtas Hashem, but each one with a slightly different expression. Most people would probably not even notice it. They're saying such nice words. And they are saying nice words, no question. Each one of them is recognized prominently in the Jewish tradition, Yisrael, of course, and Rachav as well. Rachav, according to Chazal, marries Yehoshua. She ends up marrying Yehoshua bin Nun, and many of the prophets come from her, including Yirmiya Hanavi and Chulda Hanavia. They all come from Rachav. And others. Naaman is also, the Gemara says he was a Ger Toshev, and Moshe Rabbeinu is Moshe Rabbeinu. And yet, the subtle differences convey a different approach. There is different levels, and it goes in order from the bottom up. First is Yisra, even though Yisra is really the first in history, but the lowest is Yisra. And then you have, after Yisra, you have one step up, which is Naaman. Of course, Naaman lives after Moshe and after Rachav. He's in the time of Elisha. Rachav is in the beginning times of Yeshua. And then, you, of course, you have, after Naaman, you have Rachim, and then on the top, you have Moshe Rabbeinu. But wh what, what's the difference between these four things? What was each one saying? And what was Moshe's addition, Why did they have a problem, Heaven, yes. Earth, yes. But the space between heaven and earth, that's not so simple. For this, you needed Moshe Rabbeinu. Rachav could say heaven and earth, but not the space. Yisroi still struggled, and even Naaman, could speak about earth, but it was hard for him to speak about heaven, which I guess he didn't see.
Now let's go to one more. Before we get back to this, let's go to one more step. When the Tanakh introduces the story, it says that Naaman is a great military general. He's very powerful. And Hashem saved Aram through him. That's right away in the first Pasuk. The Torah is very, it elevates him. He's a gibber chayl, he's a mitzayr. Now, the Tanakh doesn't indicate why he's a mitzayr. Why is he a leper? Usually, from a Jewish perspective, tzaras was always seen as a physical symptom of a spiritual malady. The Gemara says in Erkin, al shiva dvarim, leprosy was caused by seven things. The famous one is Lashon Hara, gossip, slander, stinginess, gasas haruach, arrogance, adultery, mm. theft, things bein adam lachaveri, of people destroying other people's lives, defaming other people, etc. But it doesn't say, what did, what did Naaman do wrong? The Tanchuma in this parasha, Parshas Tazriya says, it's because of that little Jewish girl. That Jewish girl that he was responsible for her abduction, took her away from her family and now had her working in her home. Even though the Tanakh doesn't make that explicit connection, the Medrash makes that connection. And says that's why he was a Metzorah, that's why he was a leper. Because of that. The fascinating thing would be that that little girl becomes the source of his salvation and healing. And you can imagine, and that's why I, said, I started off that she was quite wise, because you can understand that at the end of the story, she got to go home too. And the proof is, he told Elisha that he wants permission to take earth from Eretz Yisrael. So the Medrash says, the Sifri says, if you're asking permission to take earth from a land that doesn't belong to you, earth, which earth is Hefker, right? We say by Bittul Chametz, Hefker Ka'afra Da'ara. People don't have claim on earth. Nobody's going to, uh, I mean, unless it's, it's special earth or there's a special garden or design, but generally earth is considered ownerless. There's so much of it. So if he's asking permission to take earth from Eretz Yisrael to build his altar, you understand that this man has a new sensitivity, certainly, to the people living in Eretz Yisrael. So the girl also got to go home, even though that's not discussed in the story. But that was her wisdom in this process, not only getting herself to, go, to be free, but also transforming the whole Welt on Shawung from Naaman and changing his whole life, and by definition, the whole spirit in Aram as the military general of Aram. So the Tanchuma says that's why he became a leper. There's another reason he became a leper. Gemara says leprosy has to do with arrogance, and because he was so successful, he was such an arrogant person based on his military prowess, so therefore he was also penalized with leprosy. In fact, this is Malachim Beis, Kings 2. In Malachim Aleph, Kings 1, I think it's chapter 21, there's the story of how Achav died. Achav was the king of Yisrael during Eliyahu and of his reign. He had a wife, Izevel. Izevel was known as an extremely wicked person. Achav as well. But Achav was an interesting person. He worshipped idolatry and he also worshipped God and he learned Torah and he cherished mitzvahs. But he was entrenched in idolatry and ultimately became a heinous criminal. Achav was killed. How was he killed? He went to war against Aram in a place called Ramos Gilad. Now his prophets told him he could go to war, but they were false prophets. Yehoshaphat was the king of Yehuda. There was a split in the Jewish people, among the Jewish people then. There were two empires, Malchus Yehuda and Malchus Yisrael. Malchus Yehuda was on the south, centered in Jerusalem around the Beis Hamikdash. The ears of David HaMelech, Shloima HaMelech, Rechavim. And Malchus Yisrael was the breakaway kingdom, which had ten tribes under it. And the king then was Achav, that came from Yeravam's dynasty, Yeravam, who split away from Rechavim after the death of Shleim HaMelech. This was in the north of Eretz Yisrael, in the Shamron. That's why the king of Yisrael was in the Shamron, where Elisha was. That's the north of Eretz Yisrael, Samaria, it's called in English. So Achav turned to Yehoshaphat and he wanted he should join forces with him to fight Aram. Yehoshaphat asked a real prophet, Michiah, if he should go, and he said, no, there's going to be loss. One person is going to die. It's going to be Achav. Achav was afraid of what Michiah said, so he camouflaged himself as a regular soldier so the enemy shouldn't be able to identify him, so his life would be hopefully spared. And the Tanakh says that there was one of the people in the enemy, in the enemy's side, who just letumai, naively, not, not deliberately, just pulled back his arrow and shot an arrow and it struck Achav and it killed Achav. Who was this man? This was Naaman. 
And even though the Tanakh says that it was done letumai, the language, the language that's used is the language v'ish mashach bekeshes letumai. There was just man or man who pull, pulled the arrow letumai. Letumai means with tmimus. He didn't think he's killing Achav, but it happened to be that it struck Achav and Achav died. Naman took all the credit. He said, I was the one who identified, he didn't, I was the one who identified him and I managed to kill Achav. Now the Arizal says something fascinating in your second source, Lakute Torah Sefer Malachim Aleph, Ish Mashach Bekeshes Latumai, Da Ki Achav Gilgul Kayin. Achav was a reincarnation of Kayin, the Naman Gilgul Lemech. Naman was a reincarnation of Lemech. If you remember in Parshas Bereshis, Lemech by mistake killed his own grandfather, Kayin. He was going hunting and he shot an arrow. He thought Kayin was an animal and he wanted to hunt him and he killed his own grandfather, Lemech. So the Arizal says, Achav was a reincarnation of Kayin who killed his brother. Lemech was reincarnated in Naman. So what happens is, Naman kills Achav. Lemech went out to hunt. He didn't try to kill Kayin. But sometimes God orchestrates, as it says, a person is trying to do something else, but God creates what seems like a coincidence. And this ends up happening. And that's why a person runs away to the Ari Mikla, to the cities of refuge, if they didn't try deliberately to kill somebody. So they don't get a death penalty. But they weren't careful. And therefore they go to the cities of refuge. They stay there in the Ari Mikla till the Kayin Gadol dies. Then they could return. He says, this is what happened here as well. This was part of Naaman's tremendous arrogance. That he is the one who took credit for getting rid of their arch enemy, Achav the Melech Yisrael. Now Naaman is a Metzaira. He hears this advice from this young Jewish girl to go to Elisha the prophet. And he goes to the king. The king gives him permission. The king writes a letter. The king thinks the Jewish world is just like the pagan world. It's business. And the king hires prophets and they have their voodoo and their magic. It's all about money. So you send money, you send a letter. Problem is the king can't do anything. <laughs> the king rents his clothes. He tears his clothes. Elisha says, let him find out that there's a Navi be Yisrael. He can come here. When he comes here, Elisha doesn't go out to him. Elisha sends a messenger. Why does he send a messenger? Naaman is expecting Elisha to come out. He comes with an entourage. It says he came with his sword, his horse and chariot. Why is, that Why is that emphasized? Of course he came with his horse. I mean, he didn't walk. He didn't walk from Syria, Syria to Elisha's house. He probably came with a horse. Or he came with another, uh, not a vehicle, but another animal. This is a few years before the cars came around. But the point is, he came with a shebang. He came with drama. He came with fanfare. He came with his horse, with his richboy, with his chariot with his whole machina, with his whole camp. And now I'm here, I want the prophet to come out. You know, this is how it works. You have the secretary of state of another country comes. You give him a nice salute. You give him a big kabbalas ponim, a big reception. And you drink wine together and you do photo ops together. That's how it is. Elisha doesn't do that. Elisha is not here to play this game. Naaman is very offended. But this is the beginning of Naaman learning a different style, a different reality. The king can't help him. Elisha can help him. Elisha sends a message. And what's the message? The message is, I want you to go to the Yardin, to the Jordan River. Now, Elisha doesn't say, why the Jordan? Yes, the Jordan River is a humble river. I mean, it's a pretty long river. But if you've ever been to the Jordan River, anybody, it could be very, very narrow. It cuts through the two parts of Eretz Yisrael, the eastern, what's called Ever Yardin Mizracha, today Jordan, the eastern side of the Jordan, and the west what some people call the West Bank, because the West Bank of the Jordan River, but part of Eretz Yisrael, the, 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 the heart of Eretz Yisrael, the West, Eved Yarden Ma'arava, the Western side of the Yarden, go to this Yarden, and Naaman is infuriated. He didn't even come out to me. Where is his God? Wave your hand. What are you telling me, just to go take a shower, just to go, go to a mikveh? You think I don't go to the waters? You think I don't have the rivers? You probably lived... Uh, <laughs> Probably lived near a river and he went to bathe often. What do his servants say? His servants say, Elisha said, what could you lose? You would do more dramatic things. Go into the river. And when it happens and he goes to the Yarden and he's cured, this touches him obviously in a very deep way. Now he already comes back to Elisha. He doesn't go home. He could go home. 
He doesn't go home. He's moved. He comes back. He stands before him. And now you see that he's humble. And he tells Elisha, now I see that there's one true God. There's a real Elikim. And what happens? I want a gift. Elisha says, I'm not taking gifts. This is not a business. I'm not a businessman. It's not an exchange. For your money, I give you some magic. It's not how it works. And therefore, I'm not taking money for this. This is not how I make money. Elisha is an Isha Elikim. And therefore, it was time to heal you. Hashem wanted to heal you through me. I gave you the advice to heal you. But this is not a, this is not a money maker. I don't do this for a business. Naaman then is so moved that he wants earth to build an altar in his place because he's never going to offer another offering to any pagan god. It's interesting, the Yalkut Me'am Loyes brings a tradition that the Beis HaKnesses HaGadol Be'Baghdad, the great shul in Baghdad in Iraq, that's the place where Naaman built his altar to serve Hashem. When he came back, because the Aram Empire included parts of Iraq as well, parts of Bovel as well. It was a huge empire. So there's a tradition that the old big shul in Baghdad, its foundation, that's the place where there's such a, there's such a Messiah by Jews in Baghdad. Why did Elisha send a message, let him find out that there's a Navi be Yisrael, there's a prophet among the Jewish people? Elisha says this is not just a personal thing to cure him. We want to transform his identity, transform his Veltan Shawang, transform our own. And the brisker of Reb Velvel the brisker, Reb Yitzchak Zeva Levi Selavajik, says something beautiful. He says, the Rambam writes that when a Gentile accepts the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noyach, it needs to be not just because they make sense, the laws make sense, but it's because Hashem commanded people to do it. And there's a reason for that. Because whenever you do a law, because it makes sense, so what if your government is against it? What if it doesn't make sense? Enlightenment itself, human enlightenment, is not enough to secure civilization. The center of enlightenment was Germany. The center of enlightenment was Europe. In the 1700, late 1600s and 1700s and 1800s. And the idea was that human intelligence alone is enough to secure a beautiful world, a civil world. But the challenge is, as it says in Tehillim, Reish is Chachma, Yiris Hashem. The genesis of wisdom is fear of heaven you'll see that when God is eliminated completely, the Chachma also gets distorted. Because in the name of intelligence, you can justify anything and everything in the world. And therefore, the Rambam says, the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noyach have to be accepted because it's a mitzvah of Hashem. So the Brisk Rav says, that's where Elisha said, he has to know that Yesh Novi be Yisrael. Not just he should become a good person, that there's a prophet that Hashem communicated his will through Nevoah to Moshe Rabbeinu, and now to Elisha. This will make him into the person he has to become. And the Gemara Taka says in Gittin that he was a Ger Toshav. That, uh, that Naaman became a Ger Toshav, which is a true Ger, not somebody who becomes a Jew, but somebody who truly is observing the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noyach. Now, if Hashem wants Naaman to be cured, so just cure him. Wave your hands and cure him. But that's what we see as the Rishonim explained that very often the Navi will use an instrument, Bader HaTeva. He'll use a natural instrument, a natural keli, a yishtadlus and teva, in order to allow the miracle to be manifested through it. And in this case, it happened to be the Jordan River. But he will not take money, Elisha. This is never for money, because he understands what's at stake is truth. Kiddushem Shamayim. And truth is not about money. And therefore, if he takes money, Naaman will get the completely wrong impression. Gehazi doesn't understand this. <laughs> Gehazi didn't understand a lot of things. And therefore, Gehazi sees Elisha just lost a major deal. <laughs> it's like you, you, know, you introduce two, power, two powerful people and you don't get commission. That's not the way to go. Gehazi sees a tremendous financial loss and therefore he wants to get at least something. And he runs to Nama and he swears to him that Elisha needs money and he gets money from him. But when he comes back to Elisha, Elisha basically shows him that this money that you just got from Nama, don't you understand? That this money has his leprosy. This is the money I didn't want to take. This is the money that has his leprosy. I don't want this money. This is not my money. You can't be a Navi 
and a businessman together. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> it's a very important lesson. You can't be a prophet and try to make a business. It's, it's, it's just the two don't work. And when they do come together, it, it becomes very abusive. And it has terrible, terrible results on many levels. So when he receives the money of Naaman, he also receives something else. He receives the leprosy of Naaman. When he destroys Elisha's name by Naaman, because Elisha wants the money supposedly, what happens? He becomes that Naaman. He becomes that Naaman. So Gehazi now becomes, becomes the Mitzayr. But now, let's take it to the next level, which will bring us back to the four personalities, Moshe, Rachav, Naaman, and Yisrael. And for this, we have to learn one more Pasuk from Parshas Ve'eschanon. This is uh, the third source from the bottom of the first page. Moshe is speaking to the people right before his passing. And he says famously, Ve'eschanon el Adenoi ba'esahi lemer. I pleaded to Hashem during that time. Just note, Hahi is written, Hey, hey, vav, aleph. That's how it's written every day. Even though we don't read hahu, we read hahi. Ace, you don't say ace hahu because it's not masculine, it's feminine. It has a suf at the end. Ace hahi. Just note. Hashem, you have begun to show your servant, your greatness, and your powerful arm. Who is a God in heaven and earth? who can do what you can do, who has your strength. Do me a favor, please. Let me pass the Jordan and see the land on the other side of the Jordan. The beautiful mountain, the Levonine. I want to go into Eretz Yisrael. Hashem got upset at me because of you. He did not listen to me and he said, Enough, Moshe. Do not speak to me more about this thing, about going into Eretz Yisrael. And of course, Moshe does not go into Eretz Yisrael. He passes away on the eastern side of the Jordan. He goes up to the mountain called Har Nevoi, which is in the area of Jordan today. And that's where Moshe Rabbeinu passes away. Nobody knows the exact place of Moshe's burial. You see, when Moshe speaks to Hashem here, he says, Who is a God in heaven and earth that will can do like you? There's no God on heaven or on earth. Later in Veschanan, he will add those words, After this, when Hashem says, You're not going in, the Torah continues, Az Yavdil Moshe Shloish Arim. Moshe separates the three cities of refuge. The Shloisha Are Miklot that he segregates on the eastern side of the Jordan where Jews would settle. So if somebody kills somebody by mistake, they should escape there into that place. That's later in verse Khan. Now we come to the last source, which brings it all together. Sefer Megala Amukas Eifen Reish Yud Gimel. Megala Amukas literally means the revealer of secrets or the revealer of depths. Amukas, that which is amuk, depths. It's a very, very intense, complex, often mystical work that was authored by a man named Rabbi Nossin Nota Shapiro. He lived and passed away in Krakow, in Poland. He was born in 1584. That's during the time of the Beis Yosef, just for reference, a few years after the Arizal passed away, during the time of the Ramah, the rabbi of Krakow, Rabbi Moshe Isserlish. And he passed away, Yud Gimel of Shin Tzadik Gimel, which means 1633. Just for reference, 1633, he passed away in Krakow. He was from the great Kabbalists and rabbis in Poland during his day. And he's known as the Megala Mukais, the revealer of depths. He was a Rosh Hashiva in Krakow. He was a Magid, a Darshan, a Makubal, a great teacher in Krakow. That's where he's buried.
He died, as I said, in July 1633. There's something unique about his tombstone. It says in Sfarim that when you write a tombstone, you should never exaggerate because the soul is held accountable to what it says on the tombstone. So when people exaggerate, it's not a good thing. You write accurate words, not the more, not less. On the, I say this as an introduction because on his tombstone, it says something very, very unique. And I'm going to read it to you. It says, Here is interred a godly person, a holy man from the ancients. He revealed depths, he revealed secrets, and he revealed that which is hidden. It was said about him, that Eliyahu Anavi spoke to him face to face. This is what it says on his tombstone. And the Leo Anavi is, of course, the teacher and the Rebbe and the mentor of Elisha. Elisha was a disciple of Elio Anavi. Megala Mukis has different svarim. One of them is a sefer on one word. <laughs> the word of V'eschanon. And it's a few hundred pages. It's not a sefer of ten pages. It's literally a book of a few. I have it in my house. It's a thick book, a few hundred pages, on one word of Chumash, V'eschanon. Now you're going to ask me, what can you say on one word? The answer is, he gives 252 ways of how to explain the word Veschana. Reish nun beis. So he goes through method one, method two, method three, until method 252. What we're going to learn today is method 213. <laughs> so I'm skipping 212 till then. I'm skipping the other ones. And even this one. I had to take out a few parts because it gets very, very complex. I just took out a few pieces from Reish Yud Gimel, 213, how to explain Veschanon. Each method of Veschanon, each method is explaining what Moshe was thinking when he asked Hashem to go into Eretz Yisrael. What did he want to accomplish? What did he want to achieve? And he basically shows how Moshe was intimating every major event in Jewish history. And Moshe was explaining how him going into Eretz Yisrael will make it much more effective because he wants God to take care of the people and of the world during this event. And he shows how in this word and in the Psukim, that event is intimated. Now how the Megal HaMukas did this? Even one of them is astounding. You see every one, 250, it's like a completely, it's like a safe run of its, on itself. This interpretation has to do with this story in Tanakh, the story with Naaman and Elisha. Says the Megala Mukas. Megala Mukas, Oifen Reish Yud Gimel. As I said, Method 213. Ra Moshe Doi Reish El Elisha. Moshe saw, Moshe saw the future. He saw the generation of Elisha. She Bedoi Reha Yenaman Sarts Vamelech Haram. He saw the contemporary of Elisha, Naman, the, the general, the military general of the king of Aram, Melachim Beis Hei. Shehu Ha Ye Echad Me Arba Anoshim Shenos No Edo Alakodesh Baruch Hu the Tanakh is one of four who acknowledge God in the world. This is the Medrash we said earlier. In the Eretz. Four people who acknowledge God's exclusive existence, Yisroi are the higher level Naman, a higher level Rachav, and the highest level Moshe. Lachain, therefore, Gabi Naman, Ksiv by Naman, it says, V'hoya bevoi adoini el beis rimoin. Remember, before Naman leaves, he says, my king is going to come to the house of Rimon. It's a pagan house. And I'm going to have to bow down with him. Because he leans on me and he's going to bow down. I'm going to have to go down. And it's a pagan deity. I hope God will forgive me. What's this base Rimon? Why is he asking Elisha permission? Elisha doesn't give him permission to do it. Elisha just sends him off. The Ramam does say that to a non-Jew, if he's forced to worship idolatry, it's not a violation of Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noyach. But what is this base remind? So he says, Simon shall dalid anoshim elu de kachashu be medrash nir mazen be milas remind. Remind is an acronym of four people Rachav, Yisroi, Moshe, Naman. Remind. Reish yud mem nun. Rachav, Yisroi, Moshe, Naman. So when he tells Elisha, when he's leaving, he says, My master is going to come to base remind. 
Why is that important to know the name of the pagan monastery or temple where the king of Aram used to worship? Who cares if he just says he's going to go worship? It's important because Rimain represents four people who all grew up among non-Jews. Even Moshe grew up among non-Jews. Rachav was a non-Jew. Yisrael was a non-Jew. Naaman was a non-Jew. And Moshe was a Jew, but he grew up among non-Jews. And all of them acknowledged God's oneness. Remind. Umizehatam. And therefore, when he's going to go to base, to his place, he's going to a place called Remind. I'm going to remember Remind, Rachav, Yisrael, Moshe, Naaman. And I'm not bowing down sincerely to their God. Umizehatam. Tzoyliness a Pesach bishpud shall remind. Psachim ayin dalet. The Mishnah says in Psachim, page 74, that when they used to offer the Pesach offering, so you know it was the one offering a sheep or a goat that was barbecued, had to be barbecued, not cooked, and it was barbecued the complete animal, Roshay al Krav al Kirboy, and it was the idol of Egypt. The Egyptians worshipped sheep. That's why it was so difficult for them that the Jewish people slaughtered a carbon Pesach the day before they left Egypt. In fact, the Ebenezer and other commentators say that offering the carbon Pesach was a prerequisite to make the Jewish people free because the hardest thing for a slave to do is to ascertain, to accept independence. And by them slaughtering a sheep, it meant that they're not subjected anymore to the abuse of Egypt. So emotionally it's hard because a slave mentality is not just external, it's internal. As somebody once said, you know, you could take the Jew out of Egypt, but how do you take Egypt out of the Jew? How do you take Gullus out of the Jew? That's harder. So part of the Karim Pesach was to be able to help them start a new life, a life of, of true emotional, spiritual, physical independence. So how do we, so, you, so, so to roast the Karim Pesach, you need a shpud, you need what's called a spit. So the Mishnah says it be a shput shal rimoin, made of pomegranate wood. Rimoin is a pomegranate, pomegranate wood. Ask the Megala, Mukas Vasepis, and if I want to use a different spit. So on one level, it's the quality was good. He says, Shahuremez al bitla vay desore shenirmaz by bemilas rimoin. The Karim Pesach was the first thing to obliterate the idolatry of Egypt. And that's intimated in the word Rimon, which is Rachav, Yisroi, Moshe, Naman. So it's not just the physical spit of pomegranate wood. Bishput Shal Rimon is to introduce the ideas of Rachav, Yisroi, Moshe, Naman. That's the spit of Rimon with which you have to offer the carbon Pesach. In other words, you're not just roasting an animal to eat, to have a great barbecue by the Seder table. You have to understand that the Kairach, the Kairach sandwich at the Seder table was not like our Kairach. Our Kairach is missing the beef, you know? It's like you order a burger in the restaurant, La Havla, and they give you everything besides, besides the meat. So our Kairach is a little impoverished. You know, we have the Lafa, the Yemenites, their matzah is Lafa. You know, it's not like our matzah. Yemenites, I don't know if you ever saw, but their matzah is mamish like pita, like Lafa. It looks like a Lafa. That's how they do it. So imagine, that's how they used to do matzah. So the, 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 the kairich was a real lafa sandwich, like the ones you have in Israel. But not shwama, instead, not shwama, but you had either goat or meat or, uh, or lamb chaps together with the lettuce, right? Together with the maru, that's the spices, instead of the barbecue sauce. It was a real kairich. So he says, the spit is not just physically how you do it. It's the mindset of Rachav Yisro Moshe Naman. Vehine niskadesh Hashem ba'oisa pedek ha'idei Elisha, shekishetziva l'naman lirchitz biyarde. At that moment, there was a tremendous kiddush Hashem through Elisha when he told Naman to go bathe in the Jordan. Naman thought it's ridiculous. And he didn't want to do it, but he did it. And he realized that Elisha is a true man of God. So that was a kiddush Hashem which inspired Naman to go away from Avodah Zarah. That's part of the Rimoin, the last letter, which is Nun, corresponding to Naman. There's nothing in the world that's not intimated in Torah. We spoke last week, Torah being the DNA of the universe. The blueprint with Hashem, which Hashem used. So there's nothing in the world that you're not going to have in Torah. Just like there's nothing in a home. If your contractor built the home according to the blueprint... 
which is not likely. But if you have a contractor who built the home according to the blueprint, there's nothing in the home that's not going to be found in the blueprint. I don't mean furniture that you bring in afterwards. I mean the actual structure of the home. So there's nothing in the world that's not intimated in the blueprint. So this is, this is connected to what was written by the author of Tzroi Hamoy. Tzroi Hamoy is another very interesting commentary on Chumash that was written by a man named Rabbi Avraham ben Yaakov Seva. Tzroi Hamoy. It's a commentary on Chumash. He lived in Spain. He was from the Jews who were exiled from Spain in 1492. Rabbi Avraham Seva. And he wrote a Chumash commentary called Tzroi Hamoy. He was born in 1440. And he passed away in 1508 in Italy. He died on a boat. But Abavram Savar wrote a book called Tzroid Hamoy. In it he says, Atam, why did Elisha feel that he should go to the Jordan? What's up is the Jordan? You say you need something. He could have said, take a bath in your house. The Yarden. Yes. He wanted the Yarden because it was the contrast to the rivers of Damascus. It's not the Amon, it's not the Parpar. It's a little humble Jewish river that doesn't have any power and it's not always that pure and that clean and that's where you're going to be healed. It showed that the healing is not coming just from a natural and water doesn't heal leprosy. But Vasep is the Yardin. So he says as follows. When Naaman came to Elisha, what's your name? What's his name? His name is Naaman. Naaman begins with a nun and it ends with a nun. Nayin, nun ayin mem nun. Yesh b'toyre gimel p'sukim. Min oisun yudal p'sukim shemaschilim benun u mesayimim benun. In Torah there are three verses. Elisha didn't have Google. Elisha didn't have concordance. Elisha didn't have oitzah hachachma. But he knew there's three p'sukim in Torah that begin with a nun and end with a nun. And the person coming to him, his name begins with a nun and ends with a nun. Now, if everything in the world comes from Torah, so even Naaman, his energy also comes from Torah. The name of a person, as we know, is significant because the name is the channel of energy through which a person gets energy. That's why Khalilu, when somebody is ill, they sometimes add a name because it's like a channel of energy because the energy of, of, of a person's soul comes through those letters of the name. Every letter is a different conduit for energy. So the letter, the words Aish, fire, Aleph, Shin, or ma, Mem, ma, Mem, Yud, Mem. They're not just a name, Mayim, but Mayim are actually, the, those letters are the conduits for the divine energy that vivifies, that creates and animates water. The two atoms of hydrogen and the atom of oxygen, Mem, Mem, and Yud, is what's responsible for the formation and the chemistry of water, but the spiritual energy begins with the letters Mem Yud Mem, like it says in Pirkei Yovis, Basara Mamaris Nivra Ha'olam. Hashem created the world through the Asara Mamaris, through the ten utterances. Vayomer Elikim Yehiyar. Hashem said, "Let there be light." So it's not just Abra Kedabra Kedu, which, by the way, means Evra Kaadabera. I will create as I speak, but it really means Yehiyar. Let there be light. The letters Aleph Vav Resh. Those are the conduits of energy that creates the phenomena of light. And the same is true with every single creation in this world. Its name, in Lashon HaKodesh, is the conduit of divine energy. Like it says in Tehillim, Bidvar Hashem Shamayim Nasu, over Ruach Piv, called Tzvam, in Tehillim Lamed Gimel. Heaven and earth and everything was created through Dvar Hashem. Now, in the ancient times, this was considered more an aspect of faith. Today we know that every living organism, as I often say, is made up of the building blocks of DNA, and DNA is described by scientists as letters. It's seen as almost like a computer back-end program, which is made up of different letters. Of course, it's not letters in the alphabet, it's more like chemicals, but they actually call it letters, and the different sequences of letters is what shapes the unique genetic code of every single living organism. So it's incredible, as somebody once said, I once read an article, somebody said, you may, you may be an atheist, but whoever made this world by mistake, somehow everybody was using the same dictionary. <laughs> everybody was using exactly the same dictionary. So, Basara Mamaris Nivra Oilam really means that the underlying building blocks of the universe are letters. That's what they really are. It's not, it's not a, some mystical, weird, spiritual thing. The, scientifically, the underlying building blocks of the universe are actually letters. They are letters. 
And the letters are what make up the ultimate core of matter. So he sees Naman. He sees three psukim in Torah that begin with a nun and end with a nun. What are these three psukim? Says the Megala Mukas. Naman has leprosy. And Elisha says, wait. One of those psukim is the beginning of Parshas Tazriya. Nega tzaras kisiya ba'odam v'huva el hakoyen. That's Tazriya Yud Gimel Tes. Leviticus chapter 13 verse 9. Nega, a leprosy a person has, he should be brought to the koyen. It starts with a nun, it ends with a nun. V'hine naman ba'al anavi l'rafaisai. And suddenly this is what Naman did. Naman came to the prophet of the day, to Elisha, to help him with his tzaras. So already Naman fulfilled the first pasuk, which begins with a nun and ends with a nun. Of course, we know the truth that this was the advice of that Jewish girl who was in Naman's house. And the Medrash says that where did she get, why did she give him this idea? The Medrash says that she was actually reviewing her learning. She was an educated girl and she was learning the Parshish Tazriya Mitzayra. So she was learning this concept that if you're a leper, you come to the Kayan, and there's cleansing, and there's karbonus, and that's where Naaman's wife, who was with her a whole day, heard this whole phenomena. That's what the Medrash says. So she actually is the one who was learning this Pasuk, and it shows you the power of a young girl, like Yosef, when he was a slave, he completely did not lose his inner identity, or Esther, when she was abducted, did not lose her identity. Esther saved the Jewish world. Yosef saved the Jewish world. And this girl, again, transformed the Jewish and the non-Jewish world. And all these three people, Yosef was abducted, Esther was abducted, and this little girl was abducted. And she taught this Pasuk, she learned this Pasuk, and she sends him to Elisha. That's the first Pasuk. Next. Ubazenis kayim. Suddenly, a second Pasuk was fulfilled. In Parsha Shoftim, Hashem, Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Jewish people that Hashem says, Navi mekir b'cha kamayni. I'm going to, in every generation, establish a prophet from among you who is going to be a conduit for my words, a love tishma'un. This is Dvarim Yud Ches Tesvav, Dvarim chapter 18. You should listen to him. Here you have a posse that begins with a nun and ends with a nun. Navi mekir b'cha, navi elav tishma'un. So suddenly Elisha sees the first posse was fulfilled. The second posse, he's coming to a navi, he has to listen to the navi, is fulfilled. Shugam ken maschil l'mesayim benun. So Elisha says, there's one more posse that begins with a nun and ends with a nun. What is it? Parshas matos. As tzive Elisha l'rafoise b'posek hashlishi hamuske b'tayre b'parshas matos. There's a third posse. And that is, the Bnei God and the Bnei Reuven have a lot of cattle. They want to settle in the eastern side of the Jordan River, the Transjordan. They don't want to go into the western side of the Jordan because they see that there's very good pasture for their cattle on the eastern side. Moshe initially refuses. He doesn't want them to dissuade the people from going in. But they said, we're going to go fight and then we'll come back. So their language is, Nachnu naver chalutzim me'ever liyardain. We are going to be mobilizing ourselves and we'll go in front of the Jewish army on the other side of the Jordan and then we'll come back to this side of the Jordan and settle here. And Moshe agrees and this is what they did. The tribe of God, the tribe of Reuven and half of the tribe of Menashe. What happens? This Pasuk begins with a nun and ends with a nun. Nachnu me'eva liyardin. V'lachain tzivoi selirchitz biyardin. So, uh, so Elisha says, if this is the case, the key here is the Yarden, which of course also ends with a Nun, which is the end of the Pasuk. Me'evel Yarden. So he sends him to the Yarden. His name is Naaman Nun Nun. The first Pasuk with Nun Nun is, you have a Tsaras, you come to the Kayan. Second Pasuk is, listen to the Navi, also Nun Nun. The third Pasuk is, we want to go to the other side of the Yarden. So he sends him to the Yarden, which ends the third Pasuk. And that's how this person is healed. Alzeh Hischel Moshe Ve'eschanon. <laughs> so the Megal HaMukah says, now you'll understand, Ve'eschanon is the one word in Chumash that ends with two nuns. Ve'eschanon. And I'm pleading. So he says here, there's nun, and then there's a lying in nun. shall Naman. Because this prayer was really for the generation of Naman. That's what he was davening about. 
I'm davening for the two nuns, the two nuns of Naaman, and the two nuns that Elisha is going to bring up in his three psukim. Lachain Omar Ba'esahi Lamer, Ksivahu, Shekain Ba'esahu Lamer, Begamatria Tsaras. Now you understand why the Sevatator should have written, Veschanan al Hashem Ba'esahi. This is what we say, but it's really written Ba'esahu. And we pronounce it not the way it's read, not the way it's written. There's a few words in Chumash, the Kri and the Ksiv are different. It's written one way, we pronounce it differently. This is one of them. It says, Hey, hey, Vav Aleph, we say, Hey, hey, Yud Aleph. Why this change? These are mystical changes. You anyway don't want us to pronounce it Ahu. The answer is, there is something important in the Ahu. Because Be'es Ahu Lamer is the numerical value of the word Tsaras, which is a leprosy. So Veschana, two nuns, I'm davening to Hashem. Be'es Ahu Lamer about this era of Naaman with the Tsaras. Sheromaz al Tsaras, Naaman, Sheniskadesh Hashem, Aydei Oyser Maisa, Shoye Naaman Echad Me'arba, Noshem Shazacharnu. Moshe was remembering, was recall, was bringing to the fore, not remembering because this happens later, but Moshe is bringing up to the fore of his consciousness the story of Naaman, who's one of the four people who acknowledges Hashem's oneness and creates this Kiddush Hashem in history through the leprosy. That's what Moshe is davening about. Valzeh Omar, that's why he says, Asher mi keil bashamayim uba'orich az noideki yeshalakim b'yisrael. Remember, Naaman said, there's no God in the whole Oretz like Hashem. So Moshe says, Asher Mikhail Bashamayim of Oretz. Through this story of Naaman's leprosy, Hashem's oneness will be established. Ubikesh. So Moshe says, Ebra no. Let me pass, please. No nutrikun Naaman Elisha. Nun Aleph. Ebra no, we say, please let me pass. He could have just said, Ebra, let me pass. No is Naaman, Elisha. It's this relationship of Naaman and Elisha that creates this Kiddush Hashem. He's one of those four personalities. Rachav, Yisroi, Moshe, Naaman, Rimoy, who sanctifies God's name, not just privately, but Barabim in the whole world because Aram is the superpower of the time. Shekain, Ebra, Behepich, Ez Asven, Arba, Shuhoya Echad Me Arba. Evra is the same letters like Arba. You just have to topsy-turvy it. That's what means behepech, behepech asvan. If you turn around the letters, right? Evra is Arba. Aleph, Reish, Beis, Ayin, He. Because Naaman is one of those four people. So you have Evra is Arba. There's four people who are going to bring this Kiddush Hashem. No, one of them is Naaman and Elisha. Through Veschanon, the two nuns of Naaman and the three Psukim. But Esau Lamer through his Tsaras. Virotzel Likonis Laret Yisrael. So Moshe says, Let me go in Teret Yisrael. Shal Yoda Yiyakdusha Sashem Velo Yitzdarech Lanama. We don't need to wait for Naaman to do this. Let me go in Teret Yisrael. Moshe will sanctify God's name. Ve'ere Esa Oretz. And he says, Ebrano Ve'ere. What's Ve'ere? Ere Nutrikon. Er is an acronym, Elisha, Rabbi Elio Anovi. The Kiddush Hashem is going to happen through Elisha, whose Rebbe was Elio Anovi. So Moshe says, Ebra, no, let me go in. No, non Aleph, Naman Elisha. The Er, instead of having it only through Elisha, Rabbi Shal Elio Anovi, I will already fulfill that goal which Elisha will fulfill through Nama. Hey, Shiva Kaddish Baruch Hu. Hashem says, Ravlach. Literally, Ravlach means it's enough, you have enough. Or it's enough, you've been asking enough, too much for you. He says, Ravlach means, You were Mekadosh Hashem far more than the other, the other three of this group of four. Sharei Naman the Miktas. As we learned before, Naman acknowledged partial truth, part of the truth. Aval Ata, Amarta Af Bachalolo Shal Oilam Kamar Shevese B'Shem Amadush. But you're the one who acknowledged Hashem's oneness even in the ear space of the world, which Naaman didn't do. Naaman said earth. Rachav said heaven. You said Einoid. So your Kiddush Hashem is far deeper than Naaman. Don't compare yourself to Naaman. The Efsher, it's possible. Shekol HaDalad Nir That all the four are intimated in this Pasuk. If you look in the Pasuk Veschanan, which is on the other side, Moshe says, Ata Achiloi Selaharis Es Avdecha Es Godlecha Es Yadcha Achazaka, 
Ashamil Bashamayim Vartz Ashiyasech Masacho Gvurei Secha, Ebra Novera. So he says as follows. Take a look. Yisroi Sha'amar is Godlicha. The first is Yisroi. Moshe says, You began to show me your greatness. The Yisroi Gamkin Amar, Ata Yadati, Ki Godl Hashem, Mikal Elikim. Yisra is the one who said, God al Hashem, God is greater than any other God. So God Lecha refers to Yisra. Umashmu Hashamu Oba Kriyas Yamsuf Shama. The Gemara says in Zvachim Kov Tezayim, what made Yisra come from the dead from Midian? He saw the splitting of the sea. He heard about the splitting of the sea. He heard about it, so he came. Vizel Shekosav Es Yodcha Chazaka Shu Kriyas Yamsuf Netei Es Yodcha Layam. How did Moshe split the sea? Hashem said, lift up your hand on the sea. So as God Lecha is Yisra who says, Ati Yadati Ki Godel, as Yod Chazaka again is Yisrael, who was inspired by Kriya Samsov that happened through the arm of Moshe Rabbeinu. Then we have Keneged Rachov. Moshe speaks about Rachov. He says, Ashami Kel Bashamayim Uva Aretz. Who is a God in heaven and earth like you? Shem Lichel HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bashamayim Uva Aretz. Rachov was the one, the first one after Moshe to make Hashem king in heaven and in earth. Keneged Naman Omar Ebrana. And then corresponding to Naaman, he said, Ebra and Noah, as we said, Ebra is our Ba, and Noah is Naaman and Elisha. So in the words of Moshe, you have here, Moshe intimating this whole chapter of history, that Veschanon el Hashem, the two nuns, Be'esahu leimer, the tsaras, Hashem alakim, you began showing me God lecha, and Yadcha chazok is Yisra, Bashamayim of Aretz is Rachav. And then you have, Ebra no, which is of course Naman, and the era which is Elisha. I want to go in to Eretz Yisrael and make this Kiddush Hashem. Hashem said, Ravlach, your Kiddush Hashem is greater. So he says, Hey Shiva Kiddush Baruch Hu Ravlach. Hashem says, To you is Rav. Rav doesn't mean you're asking too much. Ravlach means, By you is Rav, is something much greater, much larger. Ata Gadol Min Shloshta. Your greatness surpasses all other three, Rachav, Yisra, and Naman. You added those words, Ein Oid. He made Hashem Melech even in the space of the world. If you look back in the Pasuk Veschanon, he gives here a new interpretation to those last words. Hashem tells Moshe, Al Ravlach, too much for you. Or as we're learning now, Ravlach, yours is much more, greater. Al toisev dabre lai oid badover hazah. Don't speak to me more about this thing. Literally it means, don't continue talking about this. I don't want to hear any more about it. We're not going into Eretz Yisrael. He says Hashem was saying something else. Al toisev dabre lai oid. Don't talk to me more about this because of oid. Because remember your word oid. You added ein oid. Nobody else did that. Yisrael didn't say it. Naaman didn't say it. And even Rachav didn't say it. Despite all the great things they said. And because you said that word oid. So it's a completely different space. You're in. Gadol Ata What is the Megala Amuk is telling us here? There's a fundamental here. We come to the final point. Be'ezer Hashem. There is a fundamental truth that's being conveyed in the world through each one of these in an extraordinary way. But Moshe's uniqueness is those two extra words, Ein Oid. Yisrael acknowledges Avodah Zarah a little bit, as we said. Naaman, there's only one God on earth. Rachav, heaven and earth. And then there is the Chiddush of Moshe, Afilu Bachalolei Shaloylam even in the empty space of the world. What are these four conceptions? Yisrael is basically saying, you know, there's the, there's, you go to a company, there are many managers and people that have control, but then there's the big boss. What do they say in English? The buck stops here. And you know, at certain moments, you go to the big boss, he says, listen, this is not for me. You can't come to the president, you can't come to the master, the ultimate boss, for, uh, because there's, there's a psalik in the kitchen, you'll find somebody. <laughs> but when there's a real crisis, when there's a real situation, okay. The CEO is not there to handle every little problem, you know, the janitor didn't come to clean the... 
Can't work that way. So Yisroi says, I acknowledge that there's ultimately one boss, but there's also middle management. <laughs> you can't always go, <laughs> can't always go to the top. That's why it says, Yisroi nosen mamesh bavoydet kechavan. He still gave some substance to alien forces, to alien realities. Comes Naman, and Naman already brings it to the next level. And Naman tells Elisha, like we learned his words to Elisha after he was healed, On the whole planet, there's no other Elikim. It's not just Godel Hashem Mikal Elikim. This is a tremendous moment in history as the consciousness of humanity evolves. Because what Naaman is saying here is that the oneness of Hashem pervades even the Eretz, the entire Eretz, the entire Earth, the entire planet Earth has one source, one reality. And it's not like there's middle management and there's delegation and don't bother God about this. The whole Eretz, the entire Eretz, the entire Arceus, even though you'll say it's a lowly Earth, Naaman says, there's one God. And Hashem is connected, the creator, the sustainer of everything in the entire Eretz. Rachav takes it a step further. And Rachav says, heaven too. What was Naaman's problem with heaven? The issue with heaven means that which is invisible. That which is beyond human comprehension. The Medrash over there says, like Chazuwein, if a person doesn't see heaven, the heaven that we see is a very limited part of heaven. So Naaman speaks about earth. He speaks about earth, that's where we're living. Rachav says it's not just earth, even Shamayim. Heaven, which means everything that's invisible. It's not like there's invisible forces, transcendent forces beyond the human eye, beyond the human mind, where other forces have control outside of Hashem. The concept that those believed that the Satan had power, the Malach HaMavis had power, this angel had power. Mystical forces that have, in Yiddish independence, they machen Shabbos fazich. They have their own independence. They have their own autonomy. Rachav says there's no such a thing. As Moshe says, Mi kel bashamayim ubaaretz. And that was Rachav when she says, Ba elakim bashamayim mi mal balaretz mitachas. Moshe adds one more thing. But it's not just he adds. He says, Ein oid. There's nothing else. What's the Chiddush of Moshe, Legabe Naman, and Legabe Rachav? So the Medrash says, Afilu shaloylam. Even in that space between heaven and earth. What does he mean? What happens on that space between heaven and earth? <laughs> on that space between heaven and earth, we have something very interesting. We have people. The space between heaven and earth, this is where we have humanity. <clears throat> That's the space above earth, between heaven and earth, that's chaloloi shaloilam. In other words, everything that's happening in the space between Shamayim and Aretz, he says, Ein oid. What is he referring to here? There's two interpretations. One is, the word chalol means emptiness. Chaloloi shaloilam. What does emptiness mean? The emptiness of the world. What does he mean by the emptiness of the world? The Arizal says that pre-creation, Hashem, so to speak, had to do something. What? The words of the Arizal, it has a saying called Eitz Chaim. This is how he opens up the book. That before the creation, Cholol in Hebrew means emptiness. Pre-creation, the presence, the light, the presence of infinity filled the entire space. So there was no space for the universe. Because in the presence of infinity, there's no room for anything else. If something is really infinite, infinite means it's limitless. So then it excludes every other reality, unless it's not infinite. If I'm sitting on a chair, you can't sit on the same chair because that chair is occupied. But if something is infinite, you can't sit on any chair. There's no room for a chair. There's certainly no room for an ego. There's certainly no room for otherness, for separateness. So the Arizal says the first thing that happened pre-creation was 
and this is the basis of all creation is, Hashem created what's called a chalal. What's perceived as an emptiness, a void. He calls it chalal umakim panoi. A space that can be perceived as the void, as empty from Hashem's infinite reality. And this process is known in Kabbalah as tzimtzum. Tzimtzum is an act of withdrawal. Tzimtzum, not a Chinese dish. Tzimtzum. T-Z-I-M, T-Z-U-M. Tzimtzum, like from the word litzamtzem, to shrink, to limit, to condense, to be mitzamtzem, to filter. Which basically means that there was a withdrawal, at least from the perception of the world, where there's a chalal. Chalala shalala. The Nefesh HaChaim, Reb Chaim Valozhene, writes that chalala shalala means the fact that existence experiences itself as separate, as outside from Hashem. That's chalala shalala. You're experiencing, as it says in other svarim, the chalala, the emptiness of existence, which means that every single soul, even the highest and loftiest soul, by living means, what's the definition of life? Even the most beautiful, amazing life in the world. The definition of living is, I need to face an emptiness. I need to face a chalo. What's what chalo? The chalo shaped by the tzimtzum. If there was no chalo, if all the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear as is, infinite. Ain't safe. And in ain't safe, there's no thou and I. There's no I and thou. There's no you and I. There's no connection. There's no relationship. There's no two. There's all one. That's ain't safe. So the definition of life, even the highest level of life, even somebody living in the most elevated space of consciousness, even in the most elevated space, even somebody that lives with a consciousness of appreciating the presence of Hashem still has to face the very definition of existence, which is there's a chalo, there's an emptiness. And that trauma is rooted in every soul. And that's the basis. All the pain of the world is rooted in that ultimate confrontation with a deep primordial emptiness. That the soul has to face. This is not an emptiness that comes because of what a certain person did or didn't do. Those are all symptoms. That's all part of an evolution that happens much later. But even in the most ideal sense, I have to face this soyu vavoyu, this in, intimate chalo that a soul feels. And a sensitive soul is driven crazy by it. Because it's a very powerful paradox. Because on one hand, Hashem hu elokim b'shemayim imal v'lo'itz mitochas ein oid. Moshe says ein oid. Afilu b'chalol shaloylam. Even in this chalol ein oid. And yet, it's a chiddush of Moshe. It's a revolution of Moshe, because it's not apparent. It's not intuitive. Intuitive reality is yes oid. There's chalol shaloylam. There's a chalol shaloylam. This paradox that I face a chalol. And the more sensitive soul, the more he or she feels the chalal. Because this chalal is an aberration of truth. Because truth is, everything is one. Hashem is infinite. So all reality is one. This chalal is a chiddush. It's a novelty and it's aberration of truth. A sensitive soul feels this and feels it very deeply. And I just want to say this. I'm throwing it out. I'm not going to elaborate on it. Some souls actually struggle with this. Some people could sleep at night with this problem. God is ain't safe, I exist, I have no issue. But you should know that their souls, some of them are your own children, <laughs> or maybe even you yourself, they struggle with this. They don't articulate it this way, but this is what they struggle with. Their trauma is rooted in the fact that everything feels separate. That people are separate, that they feel detached, fragmented, broken, lonely, separate from the oneness because creation was an act of separation from oneness. That's the chalal umakim panoi. It looks like you're alone, you're self-contained. And a sensitive soul knows the aberration of reality 
that's conveyed through that message, and it's the pain of existence. And that pain for a sensitive person is very, very profound. It's called existential angst. It's the ultimate existential angst. Not because anything happened to me. Because existence itself requires a person to face this emptiness. And yet, comes Moshe and says, this is the very purpose of existence. The very purpose of existence was to be able to say, that God is one in heaven. Okay, he's one in heaven. That God is the sole creator. So even Eretz, that Hashem created, Eretz is also Hashem's energy. Big, big stuff. Not everybody acknowledged that. The idea of Ein Oides, that in that place of emptiness, the emptiness that a person feels, the emptiness of the world. It's a very interesting expression. The empty space of a person, that emptiness that I'm feeling, the spiritual emptiness, the emotional emptiness, the psychological emptiness, to say Ein Oid, that's also Ein Saif. Oh, this is what Moshe taught. This is what Moshe personified. This is what Moshe embodied. That very Einoid, we spoke a few weeks ago, Pekudeh, if you remember, Beli Kol Simon, <laughs> the Simon at the end of Pekudeh, that the Beli Kol itself is a Simon. The emptiness itself, Beli Kol, it's not Beli Kol Simon, that itself is a Simon. What does this mean in a person's life? Every person has different aspects of their life. You have Shamayim, you have Eretz, and then you have Chalola Shaloylam. Shamayim is heaven. We wake up in the morning, we say, So you've given me back my soul. Soul is heavenly. Soul comes from heaven. It's pure. It's heaven. That's the, pro the first thing. That's a person has to acknowledge every person. What does, what's that song? A piece of heaven inside of me? There's a little piece of heaven. I don't remember, but you know what I'm talking about. A little piece of heaven or even a big piece of heaven. And it's, if it's heaven, it's always big. It's infinite. That's number one, Shamayim. Then there is bringing that down into Eretz. Bringing that down, not just in Shamayim, into Eretz, into earthiness. Into the crust of the earth of a person's life. Because when a person wakes up, I start off but I can't just stay in bed saying all day. Be, be nice. A person needs to face the world, needs to face Eretz. Every person in their own way. And that's the purpose of davening. The Zoyer says that the ladder of Yaakov is essentially the ladder of davening. Sulam datsloisa. Sulam mutzav artsa. V'roishoy magia hashamayma. A ladder that the top reaches heaven, but the bottom of it is standing and it's etched in the ground. In other words, it's an interlacing link between heaven and earth. That, la that ladder is the ladder of davening. It's the ladder of tefillah. It's the ladder of Torah. It's the ladder of mitzvahs of Maisim Tevim, which essentially bring down the presence of the neshama, not just into the heavenly parts of a person, but into all the parts of a person's life, the physical parts of a person's life, the earthly, the earthly parts of a person's life. The parnasa of a person, the food of a person. So the davening, the learning, the mitzvahs, the brachas, whatever it is, it brings it from shamayim into eretz. Then there is ein oid, ba shamayim imav al eretz mitochas ein oid. What's the ein oid? Ein oid is afilu ba chalala shaloylam. Chalala shaloylam is even in the emptiness of the world. You have the concept: I bring my neshama into my body. I bring my neshama into the physical stuff into the physical world. But the chalolei shal oilam, the chalolei mokoim ponoi, in the emptiness of a person. The emptiness of a person is those things that cause a person to feel empty, to feel devoid. It's the wounds of a person's life. It's the pain of a person's life. It's the anguish of a person. It's that which I would love to eliminate. It's my cause of emptiness. It's not just... I'm bringing heaven down to earth. That's amazing. But halal shaloylam is those places where God is completely concealed. That's why it's a halal. And this is the mitzvah, it says in Parshas Emer, Veloy sechalalu as shem kachi. 
We use the word Chilul Hashem. It's a very common term in our education. How does everybody translate Chilul Hashem? Desecrating Hashem's name, right? Violating Hashem's name. But the real translation of Chilul Hashem is something else. The Balatanya writes, the real translation of Chilul is Cholol. What does Chilul Hashem mean? Chilul Hashem means making believe that there's a place that's empty of Hashem. Hashem kachi. It's not just don't desecrate. It's much deeper than don't desecrate. Of course, you shouldn't desecrate. But it's much deeper. People think Chilul Hashem means, you know, they would tell us in camp, when you go on a hike, behave well, so you shouldn't make a Chilul Hashem. Certain situations, make sure it doesn't go to the newspapers, so it doesn't make a Chilul Hashem. I'm not going to elaborate. <laughs> but what happens in my own room, my own house, in my own school, is no Chilul Hashem. That, that's, that's the biggest Chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem means that there's no space that's empty. And therefore, there's no space of emptiness. We say, but, but I'm very empty. This is a space of emptiness. The cholol is only an opportunity and a message and a mission and a shlichus. And this is the revolution of the human being and the Jew on earth to be able to take the cholol and shaloylam and to reveal that this is also a flow of Ein Saif. It's an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity for transformation. It's an opportunity for awareness. When I'm feeling that emptiness, the last thing I need to do is go into depression. Depression means I acknowledge that there's no hope here. This is like a black hole of darkness that could suck you in. And it happens often. And the more sensitive people suffer from it more. Not because they're more sick, but because they're more spiritual. If they're more spiritual, they're more sensitive to it. So Moshe Rabbeinu was Megala that even Bechaloli Shaloyla, even those things that you would think are completely disconnected, it's the emptiness of the world. The emptiness means there's no Ein Saif presence. Here is the Tzimtzum. And every person has that in their own life, whatever that means in a person's life. That's where the Jew has the power, the ability to reveal the Ein Oid. And for this, Moshe doesn't go into Eretz Yisrael. Because if Moshe goes into Eretz Yisrael, there's no Chalol Eishalayla. If Moshe goes into Eretz Yisrael, it says that would have been the Tikkun HaShalom, the complete Tikkun. The combination of Moshe and Eretz Yisrael, that atomic energy, as the Megala Mukas himself explains, there could be no Chorben, there could be no Chalol Eishalayla. So he says, in order to transform the Chalol of the world, Moshe stays in the Midbar, Moshe stays in the desert. And the Jewish people throughout history transform that cavity, that empty space of Chalol into oneness, into infinity. It's the ultimate courage of a person to be able to steer at that space in me that is called Chalol, and instead of averting my gaze due to awkwardness, shame, guilt, despondency, melancholy, I could continue to steer at it and not be afraid of it. And say, Ein oid. ultimately, right here, I'll be able to touch the divine. The Radzine Rebbe has a sefer called Soid Yisharim, and he says, Chalol Shaloilam includes also humans between heaven and earth who make mistakes. People think God is everywhere besides in my mistakes. <laughs> here he's not. How could he be? So Afilaba Chalol Shaloila means even in that space between heaven and earth where people function and we're not robots. You could say angels, animals, they just follow the code. Planet Earth, they follow the laws of nature. But we, we could make mistakes. This Pchira, person has choice. That's the glory of humankind. He says, Ein Oid Afilaba Chalol Shaloila. Even in that empty space. Hashem ultimately allows the journey of each person and therefore he could be found even in those mistakes because from God's perspective, it's an invitation for healing, for repair, for growth. And he says, that's why after Moshe says, Ein Oid, the next parsha is that he separates the Ari Miklot. The Ari Miklot is somebody who makes a terrible, terrible mistake. But we say, And that's how Naaman's story begins. Naaman's story begins with Halekim Ina Liyada. He was a Gilgal of Lemech. That too is Halekim Ina Liyada. It's a very painful story. But even in that painful story, there is hope because it was not a mistake. It was not an ultimate error. It was part of a journey and therefore part of a mission. 
So when Naaman goes into the Yarden, he could come to this very deep recognition of Eretz. It's a very powerful recognition. And it brings humanity to a certain space of Kiddush Hashem. That's what the Ger Toshev understands. Rachav adds, Yisroi is the beginning of the process. Moshe ultimately is the one who reveals the ultimate truth of what all of them are saying. The Rimoin, Rachav, Yisroi, Moshe and Naman. That Have a wonderful week. You know, when, when somebody's experiencing uh, uh, mental illness or deep anxiety, you know, our first, and, our first and primary role is to serve as an empathetic witness, to be able to contain them, be able to be there for them. Now, when a person really goes deeper, right? It really challenges us to deal with the ultimate emptiness of existence. And you'll see that these people are so spiritually sensitive because they feel the oneness in the world. And the fact that we all live on one level in such a different fashion drives them mad. And they really want to go back to that oneness. And you know, another Venaviyu, another Venaviyu, the Rechaim says, not even a view. They couldn't deal with it. They wanted to kiss infinity. And they, they, they were consumed. That's exactly what they wanted. They didn't want to deal with the tzimtzum. They didn't want to deal with the tzimtzum. I don't want to deal with Cholo. I don't need no Chilol Hashems. I want to be one. And the ultimate avoid of a person. And this is really, this is really the most greatest gift we can give people. The greatest gift we can give people is to realize not to be afraid of the tzimtzum. Because God is not afraid, you don't have to be afraid. In fact, not only you don't have to be afraid, you were sent into the cholol to transform it. That's why you were sent there. Transform the cholol into ein oid. That's the greatest gift we can give to people. No greater gift. Especially to the spiritually sensitive among us. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.